Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to PsychAx. I'm Dr. Orion Taraban, and today I'm very happy to be speaking with Mr. Rob Ager. Uh, Rob is a uh, he has a number of YouTube channels that I followed over the years. I think first and foremost is Collative Learning, in which Rob gives some really deep and insightful analyses on some of my favorite films. And uh, I've been a fan of his channel personally for many, many years. So I'm very, very stoked to be talking with you today, Rob. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. It's great to be here. And I have to say, Orion Taraba, I love that name. <laughs> that's like that's something out of a, some crazy science fiction movie. I thought I was like, a, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's an yeah. intense name. I didn't choose it, of course, but it's, it's something I've tried to grow into. It was tough yeah. when I was younger, but it's, uh, it's nice to have when you're older. <laughs> so, uh, Rob, I remember I th that you posted a, an episode a while back that was something along the lines of like, why is it so difficult for people to appreciate that there might be deeper levels of meaning in film? Like, I, 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 I'm assuming that's coming from a perspective of you sharing some of your interpretations with maybe friends or folks on the internet and them saying, ah, you're, you're just reading too deep into this. It's just a movie. Uh, so I think we're talking about semiotics here, the the reading of symbols. Why do you yeah. think why do you think this is so difficult for folks? And and how can people learn how to read film as a like a medium? Well, uh, it's a strange one because when I first started posting the videos, I didn't think anyone would be interested in the stuff. But um, turns out there are some people who are really into the stuff. You know, I was quite surprised. I thought it would only be other filmmakers, but. You know, there's a lot of regular everyday people who are, who are interested in this stuff. And if you start telling them about it um, and showing them the little bits and pieces from the movies or you're pointing out things from movies that they're already familiar with, um, then they're like, oh, my God, yeah. And they, they can even remember from the scenes the details that you're talking about. And, and they love it. You know, some people do. But, yeah, a lot of people just really back off from this stuff and like, whoa, 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 whoa. I just want to go with the surface plot of the movie. I just want to believe what I'm told by the characters. And there's a simple straightforward narrative that you follow. It's got a middle beginning and an end. And at the end, you're told what the full story is. And that's it. And then the movie's over. And then you just go away. And that's that's that. Um, but yeah, this this idea that there are movies which uh, that have a lot of hidden stuff uh, that isn't obvious a lot of people are really uncomfortable with it. And um, it shows in the, the choice of movies that they watch as well. Um, you know, the type of people who don't want to go anywhere near the movies of like David Lynch or something like that, because you don't get a very obvious explanation at the end of the movie. And they hate walking away confused. Uh, they, they, they feel uncomfortable with that confusion. And um, I mean, there's a, there's a, a few different things that I think uh, this is down to. Uh, one, I think, is we humans have got into this sort of verbal reality that we've created for ourselves, which is incredibly useful. Uh, you know, we go around and we, we take this incredibly complex world that's around us and we apply all these verbal labels to these complex things just so we can have a, a simplistic organizing approach to reality. Oh, there's a car, you know, but a car is actually an unbelievably complex thing if you actually go and study it in detail. Um, so I think that's an issue is people don't like delving out of the comfort zone of simplistic verbal uh, reality. And once you get outside of that, it's like, oh, my God, the world is too complex and I'm getting a headache and I'm not sure if I can handle this. So I think there's that reaction a lot of the time. And uh, another one is that I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with the idea that they've been deceived, that somebody has come along and made a movie and they fooled the, the person who was watching it into thinking it was about one thing and it turned out there was a load of other stuff going on there. And I think sometimes it makes people feel like um, uncomfortable. It's like, I mean, people have a problem with deception generally anyway. Uh, a lot of people like to just follow the newspaper headlines and stuff to get their reality about how the world works. And of course, the real world is way more complex than the newspaper headlines. Um, so that that's a big factor as well. And uh, I think when people watch movies, a lot of the time they just want to be entertained. They want to get away from the world of deception. And um, I mean, there's a thing about movies as well where um, you have the you know good guys and bad guys in movies, and p 
people love the simplicity of good guys versus bad guys in movies. But in reality, you can't always tell who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. So, you know, that that makes things nice and comfortable in movies. You don't have to deal with deception so much. The bad guys make it obvious that they're a bad guy. And that mm -hmm. type of thing. So, yeah, the, the complexity and dealing with the deception that's gone on when a movie has deeper themes, I think those two things people have a major problem with. So among other things, what I'm hearing is that it's like an emotional discomfort over overwhelming or incomprehensible complexity that tends to turn people off. And maybe there's a sort of literacy that comes with being able to read sim symbolism in film or in literature or in other works of art that people don't practice and, and therefore don't have. But maybe some people have the potential to move in that direction, but they might feel emotionally uncomfortable about doing so because it might shatter some of their let's say, comfortable worldviews. I really yeah. like what you said about the simplicity of good versus evil, because I think that some of the best works of art, whether it's film or literature, is not really about good versus bad, but about two, two. Sorry, you, like sorry you, you cut out a little bit there. Can you just oh. go back a little bit? You cut out for about five seconds. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I heard everything on, on my end. So what I was saying is uh. that I really like what you said about the good versus evil being too simplistic, because in my opinion, all of the best literature or film is not really about good versus evil. It's about two mutually incompatible worldviews that each have their merits, but they can't both be held at the same time. I'm actually working on an analysis of Les Mis, the book and, and the musical, because there's this fundamental antagonism between Javert and Valjean that I think is actually mirrored in kind of like the old versus the New Testament. You got you got Javert, who's like an eye for an eye. There has to be order when there are bad guys and good guys. And that's totally incompatible with the, let's say, the New Testament worldview, which is that people can change, people can be redeemed. And um, once a bad guy, not always a bad guy. Because if we open up the possibility to that, it really throws all of the order of the, uh, the Old Testament covenant into chaos. And that's exactly what happens to Javert at the end of the film. So, mm. uh, and, and it's not that Javert is a bad guy. He definitely has a point. We need justice. We need order. Um, we need sentinels in the night to look out for folks. So it's not that he's he's bad. He's just, you can't have both of those worldviews at the same time. And so it's a contest to see who's kind of going to come out in the end ahead. Now, with the deception, this is something that you I remember you talked a lot about in your analysis of 2001, which I think is just absolutely brilliant, where you talk about how on the surface, this film seems to be like uh, a movie about first contact. It's about, um, you know, the star baby elevating into the next dimension of human consciousness. But I think I'm getting it right. Your argument is that Kubrick was actually trying to make a commentary on like cinema itself. Is that fair to say? Yeah, partially, yeah. Yeah. I'm and it's sure talking it's... about the medium itself and how the medium can be deceptive, you know. And uh, um, I'm not, not to go over it too much because uh, I've covered this stuff a lot before, but the whole idea about touching the monolith and the monolith being the cinema screen in disguise, but it's been rotated at 90 degrees. Um, when you touch the monolith and you're touching the movie screen itself, it's like if you sat at home or you sat in a cinema. And you're watching this movie and you think, oh, this is so real. But if you go up and touch the screen, it's like, it's not even fucking real. <laughs> you know, I can touch the screen right now and you are not really in front of me. And, you know, we've got this communication going on digitally. But um, I think that's part of the concept of 2001 is that stop believing what you see on your screens and just go and touch the screen and realize that it's just a magical display that's going on. It's not reality. You know? I think that's part of the whole 2001 thing. Yeah, and the way that you worked in all of those rotational um, gestures, you, you noticed the rotational gestures in the movie to turn the monolith from vertical to horizontal to mimic the panoramic symbols. I, I never would have picked up on that. I thought that was very observant, Rob. Now, I do believe that you mentioned that partly the reason why that level of meaning might have been buried under the surface in 2001 was that Kubrick couldn't really get that film produced. Like, no one was going to pay to bankroll a film about the, the illusion of cinema. They wanted, this was in the era of, I guess it, it was before Star Wars, but we're getting into the space race and this was very popular. And, mm. and so he kind of had to do it for pragmatic reasons. Uh, 
So the question I have for you, I'm going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate here, is if if what you're saying is true about these hidden levels of meaning, and if the filmmakers really wanted people to understand these levels of meaning, why did they go through the trouble of hiding them? Like, why don't they just tell the people what they really want them to know? Okay, uh, there's something that I think is going on, uh, particularly with Kubrick and Lynch and people like that, where the challenge in the audience, it's like they're saying, I'm not going to hand it to you on a plate. I'm going to give you lots of clues and you're going to do the rest of the work and figure it out. You know, it's like uh, there, there was actually a, <clears throat> in the novelization of 2001, which Kubrick wrote with Clark and Kubrick had authorization rights on that novel. He was able to override Clark. Um, in the novelization, there are many, many monoliths all over the earth. It's not just the one that arrives. There's tons of them with different ape groups. And the apes are being tested. It explains that it's it's not just about training the apes. It's about testing them. And so the monoliths are looking for the apes with the most potential. And so it tests them with a, a number of perceptual tricks. And I, th I think at one point they have to throw stones at the, the monolith. And there's like a target on it. And they have to throw stones and hit it and stuff like that. So it's looking for apes with potential to really develop, and it doesn't bother with the rest. And you know, this it's quite, it, you could say it's kind of like snobbish and elitist. Um, but I think Kubrick was basically just he wasn't trying to make a movie that everybody would be able to get. I think he knew that for a lot of people it would be just be like too much of a headache for them, or they couldn't be bothered, they're not motivated. Well, I think he realized that there would be some people around who would be really interested in developing their understanding further of the movie. And because the movie doesn't give verbal explanations, those people would have to explore the visual, uh, you know, the non-verbal, the metaphoric, the symbolic. Uh, they would have to delve into that and gradually start to decode what he'd put in. Yeah, And so that, you know, the, the novelization is very specific about that, about, um, I think that there was a point where it actually said that the monolith was there to find out whether the apes were worth helping. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> wow. um, I, I think Kubrick may have said that in an interview as well at, at one point. Um, I can't recall if it was just in the novelization. But yeah, that, when I came across that, I was like, my God, is this is this the, the attitude Kubrick was taking with, with this film? It was like, I'm, I'm going to hit you with this really tough puzzle that is right outside your comfort zone, right outside of your familiar verbal thinking, and it's definitely outside of the thinking of the investors, so they're not going to get it. Um, but if there's some of you out there who are going to be open to this stuff, who are really willing to step outside of the usual mental boundaries, and here you go, I've got something for you. I've got like a cinematic Rubik's Cube, which if you can break it down and figure it out either individually or collectively figure it out, then you can have the the, the goodies that are hiding underneath, yeah, the, the hidden narrative. I like that. Well, let's let's kind of pivot a little bit and talk about, um, I, I think this is an interesting connection. So like, why, why do symbols even work at all? And I think there has to be some sort of psychological response to that question that the, the reason why symbols might be so rich, especially as a communicative medium, is that like a rose is not just a rose. A rose can also be beauty. It's also about sexuality. It's the color of the rose could be passion or it could be friendship. Um, that these are all associations that we have with the symbol, either the word or the image of the rose, that we can kind of play with without even uh making it seem like we're activating those associations and so they they seem to be in play in our consciousness even though we may not be actually perceiving them on the screen do you think that that's part of what we're talking about here definitely yeah i mean this i mean it's it's it is kind of a, you've hit on an irony there with the, there's a lot of people who resist this kind of symbolism in movies because they're not used to this kind of symbolism <clears throat> but Symbolism is there in their life every day, and they use it when they speak. They don't realize they're talking that way. Um, you know, if 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 they if they meet someone who is very, uh, say, intelligent, they'll refer to that person as bright. 
how are they bright? It's not like they're actually emanating light, but they use that term. And that is such an inbuilt um, metaphor that we all use it as if it's a real thing, you know. Um, so it seems like people are really okay with using symbolism that they're familiar with and they know that everybody else is familiar with. But when you start getting into new types of symbolism or more complex symbolism, then it's like, oh, they start to back off. Yeah. Sure, because I think at basis, all language that we use, human language, is metaphorical in its essence, because otherwise we would just be talking in tautologies. Like if I were to say uh, a rose is a rose, like that's X equals X as a mathematical proposition, which is yeah. true, but totally not useful and not interesting information. So the way that we communicate is we actually say it looks X equals a times B or something like that. So we we can kind of transmute this one variable into a combination of other variables and still maintain some sort of equality between them. And that's how we can kind of expand our conceptual understanding of the universe is through metaphor, is through which yeah. is basically a, a graded comparison between two things, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean uh, I I I've been getting it quite into the idea of um I've been learning a bit more about, about mathematics recently. I've been studying, uh, I've, I've, I wrote a huge video, which I'm still editing, which is about uh, cubic reality. Um, and it covers 2001 Space Odyssey, the movie Tron, and uh, the video game Minecraft, you know, with this cubic blocky world. Okay. And um, cubism in Picasso's artwork. It goes through a whole bunch of historical cubism things that have happened in the past 120 years. And uh, I was I was very interested because I was like, there's something in this. There's patterns going on here. What is what is it with this cubic reality thing that people are drawn to? And so I started like um, researching a bit more about uh, mathematics, and mathematical theories, and I sort of started. I'd already suspected this for a while, but sort of came to the conclusion that mathematics itself isn't the real thing. It's actually symbolic. You know, numbers are just symbols. Um, if you go through history, there's been different numerical uh, systems that have existed. Yeah, the, the Roman numeral system, most of us are familiar with that. We get taught it in school and we've got our own system. And there's, there's all these different ones uh, with, with it's not just the 10 point thing. But I, I think the main theory is that we, we have a, a 10 point, um, you know, 10 numbers because of the, the number of numbers of fingers and thumbs on our hands. So it makes it easier for us to count in tens. So that. Um, 10 digit system, which is used everywhere in the world today. Um, it's almost like taken over to the point where we think it is real, but it's just one other form of, it's just another set of symbols. That's fascinating. Yeah. So you're basically saying it's an anthropomorphized uh, view of reality that's been like reified as something that's objective to nature, which isn't true because even though I think every culture in the world now uses the base 10 system of mathematics. That hasn't always been true. In fact, our computers are not running base 10. They're running binary. Um, and exactly. And yeah. base eight. Um, but I think the Mayans used a base 12 calculation, which I think would be very difficult for me and most modern people to, no, to We don't have to retrain our perceptions Completely. to deal with that. But it's not any more or less real than the one we've already got. Yeah, I, I used to be a math professor and I used to tell people that math wow. is not about numbers, it's about quantity, which is a different thing. And quantity is really about relationships. Like the, the number 0.75 is about the relationship between three to four and three and four are not really numbers because they are quantities in and of themselves that can be reduced into different kinds of relationships. Like there is no value in and of itself. All values exist in proportion to other values. So yeah. when we're talking about an absolute, that's kind of a, a misnomer. We're actually just comparing it to some other things. So everything is about relationships. Um, so let, let's talk about this. So if the symbolism of film is related to, let's say, the psychological associations that people have in their minds about certain images, would it be fair to say we could take a film like Mulholland Drive, which I just rewatched yesterday, and show that to like, the folks in Papua New Guinea, and they're going to be able to pick up on the symbolism? Or is there stuff in Lynch's films that you kind of need to be trained by maybe other Lynch's films or by Western cinema in general to be able to perceive? Like, are these symbols contextual or are some of these symbols universal? 
definitely a mix of the two. Um, I mean, it's just, you know, with, with, with Lynch, I mean, a, a key thing is just figuring out which scenes are dream sequences and which aren't, you know. You, as far as I tell, with, without doing that, you cannot figure out the proper narratives of the films. Like Mulholland Drive, it's actually got a very, um, uh, it's got a narrative that makes perfect logical sense in, in a, a standard plot way. It's just that it's presented through a mixture of dream sequences, which I think is about something like the first two thirds of the movie, I think is all dream sequences. And then you start getting presented towards the end of the movie with the waking state experiences. And you have to relate those to the dream experience scenes in order to figure out what really happened. So, you know, you get one character who shows up, but they represent a different character. Uh, you know, in real life, they were a different character, but in the dream, they are somebody else. Um, I mean, that, that stuff kind of goes, I would say that's, it's difficult to work out, but I think that can be figured out by people from any culture because in all cultures, people dream. Um, and I, I, I would, well, I don't know if there's been any research done on this, but I would assume that uh, the similar kinds of base symbolism goes on in dreams across all cultures. I, I should imagine that somebody from some faraway culture that is really exotic and different to mine um, if somebody there has a dream, I'm pretty sure that in their dreams, every now and then somebody will pop up in the dream who who visually looks different, but they represent somebody who exists in that person's real waking state. That you know the person has been um, represented differently in the dream. I, I would assume that that happens across cultures um, in all dream states. So on that basis, I would say people from any culture should be able to look at a movie like Mulholland Drive and start figuring it out. I suppose you've got the language barrier might make it awkward as well. Sure. Yeah, I don't think it's research, but I think Paolo Coelho said that shepherds tend to dream of sheep, which kind of makes sense. <laughs> but what we're getting at, I think, is uh, the possibility that there may be universal um, symbolism that all human beings are capable of perceiving and understanding. And in psychology, the guy who most people are aware of did the most work on that is Jung and the archetype. Yeah. And I think one way that we can think about archetypes is that they're universal symbols, <clears throat> that they exist in the collective consciousness and may even have like a biological origin. Yeah. And these are ways of perceiving that all human beings are capable of um that all human beings are capable of regardless of their culture or their language. So these are symbols like um, like death or like um, the wise old man or um, the empress, things like that. You know, mm -hmm. the kind of stuff that shows up on tarot cards, actually. Yeah. So it, I think that there is a strong argument for the possibility of archetypal symbology in all human beings, just like there seems to be some universal human emotions that are always kind of, as far as we know, experienced, but certainly expressed in the same way, regardless of people's culture or socialization. Um, what have you What have you done with respect to Jungian archetypes in your work, Rob? Well, funny enough, I just finished editing uh, it was yesterday morning or the day before. Um, a new video that I haven't put out yet, which is on um, Carl Jung's uh, quite short book called The Undiscovered Self. Um, I read that for the first time uh, recently, and it's only 79 pages, so I took tons of notes and recorded that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this, I've been aware of Carl Jung's stuff for a long time. I've read about his theories, but I never read his books until recently. I think I'd read some of his papers before. Um, and I, I think he's fantastic. He's absolutely brilliant. He was so ahead uh, of the curve. And it, like the stuff that he was writing way back in the 1950s is absolutely relevant today. Um, yeah. So I mean, was there some specific aspect of Jung that you wanted to discuss? Or? Well, you've made a couple of videos on the shadow. And I think the shadow is really interesting because there are a few different ways that we can approach the idea of the shadow, both in Jungian psychology and in other forms of psychology. Um, I think there are two general um, ways to approach it that I'm aware of, and, and you can correct me if you if you want to change the definition or if you have another idea. One is that the shadow is sort of the disavowed self, 
It's the part of myself that I don't allow myself to acknowledge. And so I deny and repress and, and see it in other people and want to destroy the projected evil that I perceive in others because yeah. I'm unwilling to accept it in myself. I think that is the more, let's say, Jungian um, mm -hmm. approach to it. There's mm -hmm. another um, idea about the shadow that basically says the shadow is kind of inescapable. Even if you were to do all of this deep personal you know, psychological work to kind of like understand your demons, as we say, to integrate your shadow, you still have a shadow. You can't get away from it because your shadow in this conceptualization is just the sum of all of your unchosen lives. That it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the path that you didn't take. And on some level, the shadow becomes even more dangerous to the individual when the unchosen path represents let's say, greater happiness and prosperity than the one that you decided to take. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so just trying to think there. So so you're talking about the like the, the rejected part of ourselves. Absolutely. That's so big. Yeah, I, I totally agree with therapy. that. And we project it onto others and then we we hate the other people who we project it onto. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, um, I mean, Jung talked about that in terms of world, of, world affairs, wars and stuff you know it's like you said virtually all wars it's just two sides each projecting their own shadow onto the other side and then attacking it you know so uh, um you talked about the the mutual withdrawing of projections as a way of stopping war not an easy thing to persuade all the leaders to do is it um and then the other one you mentioned can you just clarify that for me a little bit again yeah rather than be like so in the first definition, the things that I'm disavowing of myself are like my own capacity for cruelty, my own darkness, my own hatred, my own envy and selfishness. I, I'd prefer, you know, like I'd prefer to think of myself as all good, as righteous, as honest, yeah. as forthright. But the, like those those darknesses live inside of me, you know. And I if if you I don't get rid of them, they're, they're always there. Kind of can't. They're, they're, they're built in. Um, into our, our it's in, it's in our nature the way we we grew up and you know and the way we evolved we had to fight we had to be we had to fear you know all that kind of stuff yeah it's you can't get rid you can become aware of the shadow and lessen its effect on you so that you don't project so much but you can't get rid of it I mean, that's my understanding of it yeah, and I think that the more that I do that shadow work myself and accept those parts of myself, I become more compassionate and patient with other people because it's oh, like, yeah. and yeah. when I see this in other people, I'm like, well, you know, have I really done, have I done something that bad myself in the past? Maybe I have. Could, and if I haven't, could I? Yeah, I probably could. So, um, you know, I don't want to give bad behavior a pass, but it is important to the, we can respond to bad behavior without necessarily needing to hate it or destroy it. Absolutely. So, yeah. so that's, that's one part. The other part is that, um, like, think, of, think about this. Maybe there's an archetypal story. I can't think of one on top of my head, but there's like two twin brothers and one person takes the path of I'm becoming a scholar and I'm working hard and I'm getting married and becoming a productive member of society. The other person takes the path of, I want uh, a, a life of adventure and exploration and um, danger and uh, like this intensity of life. Neither one is necessarily bad or wrong, but one is kind of the shadow of the other because they couldn't take, you, you either take one path or the other. Mm -hmm. And on some level, that twin becomes the shadow of the other person because um, they represent all of their, the, the way their life could have been, but they didn't choose. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, all of the uh, motivations, the desires that would have unpinned, the, the, that would have been the basis of that alternate life if it had happened, you go down a different path. But I could, guess you could say the edge for the, the path that you didn't go down, that edge is still there. You, you could refer to that as like the shadow. Sure, because whenever we make a choice, we actually have to forbear every other decision out there. And so every decision requires the sacrifice. And that means like actually giving up a, a huge part of our lives and a huge part of our, our potentiality. It's yeah. like my best friend in, in high school, he right out of college went to law school and he got a corporate job and he bought a house and got married. And I was an actor and I was living this kind of life. And 
he would look at me sometimes and think, oh, Ryan, you're so free. You get to do kind of whatever you want. And I was like, yeah, but I'm broke and you got a nice yeah. house and a fancy car. So it's like it, we just represented the, the path that the other didn't take. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's and a lot it, of paths. <laughs> there it is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But so I think in that case, the shadow is more around like choice points. It's like if I could, um, you know, what would my life have been like if I didn't marry this person or mm. if I didn't become a doctor? But it's usually around really or even that this tragedy didn't befall me. You know what I'm saying? That's a big one. Yeah. Um, so it's not necessarily about the the negative. That's just another way of looking at it. But we can talk about either one of those definitions of the shadow or something else. I think I got what you mean there. Yeah, I mean it's um, the, the the term shadow because shadows are literally dark implies that it's a negative mm -hmm. uh, nature to the to the shadow. But yeah, I definitely agree. There's either whether you would call it the same shadow or whether we've got multiple shadows that come with us and some are more positive, some are more negative. Yeah, but definitely I, I agree that there's um an unconscious side of us that follows us that's full of positive things definitely yeah i definitely agree that's the case i mean whether you want to lump that in with the negative side and call it as one or whether you can separate it out into different pieces but then but we're getting into mathematical uh, sure. uh relationship comparisons there so I don't think the words really can do it justice, can they, you know? They often can't. So I was bringing this up in the context of your analysis of a full metal jacket. Do you want to talk about that or do you want me to try? Yeah, to great. Yeah. yeah. So what do, you, what do you see as the role of the shadow in that film? Uh, the main thing that I see is the, the split between the two halves of the movie, the first half and the second half. Um, a lot of people don't like the second half of the movie. And this is quite interesting because... Uh, I mean, Jung talked about that a lot of people don't like accessing their own unconscious. They don't want to be aware of their own shadow. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? You know, so um, so naturally they don't like the second half of Full Metal Jacket so much because it gets into the the the, the, the Jungian shadow thing. Uh, and you know, Kubrick did talk about Carl Jung in relation to Full Metal Jacket in interviews. He specifically said that he and the co-writer Michael Hare, who wrote the book. Uh, it's called Dispatches, which Full Metal Jacket takes many of its scenes from. Um, Kubrick said that he and Michael Hare were specifically talking about ways of getting Young's The Shadow into Full Metal Jacket. So, I mean, you know, never mind all the secrecy that with 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, Kubrick was pretty open about putting uh, Jungian shadow concepts into Full Metal Jacket. It's not so obvious when you watch the movie because nobody tells you except for that one moment when um, the Joker character is talking to, I think it's a colonel or a, um, some high-ranking officer, and uh, the officer the officer demands to know from why have you got a peace symbol on your, your jacket and you've got Born to Kill written on your helmet. And Joker says, I was trying to make um, a comment about the duality of man, the Jungian thing. You know, that that's quite a blatant giveaway for Kubrick. I mean, he's not normally that blatant, but, you know, he slipped it in there. Um, so yeah, but for me, the overall split that happens in that movie is between the first and second half. And the way I view it is that the recruits in the first half of the movie, they are shadowed in the second half of the movie. Those recruits in the first half are reborn as the Lust Hog Squad in the second half of the movie. Uh, I did have a video up there. In fact, it's still up uh, about Full Metal Jacket called, um, it was about the Private Pile character, um, Born Again Hard, I think I called the, the video. Just a second yeah, I watched that one a few days ago. I thought that was really insightful. Yeah. So, so you know the basic point where Pri Private Pile, his death is symbolic in the toilets in the first half of the movie. And that's like killing off the, uh, the innocent child. He's like a baby-like innocent character. And in the military training, they want to kill that off. They want to get rid of your innocence and your, your, your childishness and just turn you into a, a man. I mean, they literally call you, we're going to turn you into a man. That That's standard jargon in you know military training. So they want to get rid of the infant. So he gets killed off uh, symbolically in the first half. And then he comes back in the second half. Uh, his shadow is the character called Animal Mother. 
And if you watch the two characters, they have similar facial expressions, similar height and build. One's fat and the other one's suddenly become lean. And um, yeah, so this uh, that that's your shadow at work right there. And But neither of them is aware of the other animal mother never ever makes any reference to uh, the first half of the movie. In fact, in the second half of the movie, nobody talks about the first half of the movie at all. Um, the cowboy character shows up in the second half and Joker meets up with them. But it's like the first half of the movie didn't even exist. I think that freaked people out in watching Film Metal Jack. It's like you're watching two separate movies. Um, and I think it was like uh, two, heart, two hemispheres of the brain separated, you know. Um, but it's not just Animal Mother who that happens with. Lots of the other characters in the first half of the movie appear to be reborn in the second half. So you've got Private Snowball, which is the black character in the first half. Um, he becomes Private Eight Ball in the second half, and he gets killed later. Um, and yeah, yeah so that, that's that's the way I look at it, is that the, the, the squad is reborn as their Jungian shadows in Vietnam, and the military has split their psyche so that they become somebody else. And they can't even remember who the hell they were when they started the basic training. But there, there was one, um, a very clear clue that I found in the, the Full Metal Jacket script. Um, if you look in the movie, the Lust, the Lust Hog Squad, has got, it's got a number, it's 4092 or something like that. You, um, but in the script, it's the, the trainees who've got the, that number. So they, they've got their squad and it's the, named 4092 or whatever number it is. And in the movie, it switches to the Lust Hog Squad in the second half. I thought that was quite interesting, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been a, a, a while since I've done any videos on Full Metal Jacket, but that's the general uh, Jungian gist uh, that I got from that. Yeah, I think that's brilliant because I remember the first time I saw that movie back when I was a teenager, I would not have been able to make that interpretation. I think my sense of Private Pyle's suicide was it was a commentary on just like the brutality and cruelty of the military. Yeah. And it, you know, it, this, it just destroyed this person through like this ritualized trauma. And it was a commentary on the evils of militarism and maybe even American imperialism. Well, like, I do think it was that as well. Uh, I mean, this, this is the thing is like with Kubrick, he, he, he wasn't just, he didn't just feel the need to present one narrative. He was happy to present you with a number of different things um, which all have some truth to them. And yeah, the first half of the movie works very well on that point. And I always perceived it on that level as well. So I'm not saying that that version of the first half of the movie is, is invalid. Um, it's just the Jungian take on it is it's just a different uh, view of it. But the, the good thing about that Jungian take is it does make kind of sense of the second half of the movie. And that's where people get confused. What, where, what the hell is this second half of the story? Where's it going? What's it about? Yeah, yeah and, and that's why it's weird. It's it, When I watch some of your interpretations of films, and I think this is probably true for symbolic interpretation in general, it's like when I hear your vision of it, it like makes so many things clear. And it's almost like that moment of, of that makes total sense. And I kind of on some level knew that without even knowing it, that I think is the confirmation of the validity of the interpretation. It's like the things that you point out are absolutely true, but they were just happening subliminally, like below the, the level of my own awareness. Um, but everything kind of shifts and there's a great deal of like integrity between the between everything that previously just seemed confusing and disjointed. And hence the reason why you would click to watch a film analysis of Full Metal Jacket. You wouldn't watch it if you didn't think there was more there. <laughs> well, yeah. absolutely. And I think I think you're right. Most people really prefer the first half of that movie, which is weird because the second half is the war movie, you know, on some level. It's the action. It's the killing. It's the... Yeah. I think part of the reason why a lot of folks don't like the second half is because it's not actually just a flat-out war pick it has this like meta narrative of the soldiers in action, but also like being interviewed about being in action, which mm -hmm. sort of like breaks up the action of the war movie, which is unusual. I don't know any other war movie that's kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, there's, yeah, there's a, a funny aspect of it where it's like in the second half of the movie, you know, they talked about John Wayne a lot in the film, both in the first and second half, there's references to John Wayne. And it's, it's kind of like in the second half of the film, uh, all the soldiers are acting like they are in a movie. 
Um, you know, even in like the first battle scene, it's like they're all posing for the camera, you know, trying to look tough for the camera and stuff. And um, and you got the when they're all sneaking up towards that building where the, there's I think there's snipers or something up in the building, not the end of the movie, the first battle scene. Um, they all just blast this this building to pieces. Um, and it's so staged and choreographed. It's it's like they it's like they are they, it's, it's almost like they're aware that they're in a movie. It's like we are in a war movie. And um well I think that was part of what they play it up and we're gonna act it up. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's part of why the Vietnam War, as I understand it, was so unpopular because it was the first excessively televised war. Yeah. So that could be like a kind of historically accurate. Um, you also talked about the military creating a man, and I'm actually doing a number of pieces on like performative masculinity. And so maybe the introduction of the camera in the film is a commentary on how we, it's like we, we, that men these days are, are acting as if they were men on some level, that they, that's more of a performance of masculinity than, um, than actual an masculinity. embodiment <laughs> of, of being a man, potentially. Fascinating yeah. stuff. Okay. Um, can I pivot again, Rob? To a oh, different yeah. Subject? Okay. Cause Bounce we're, around whatever subjects you want to talk about. I want to be sure we get to this because, uh, I'm one of the biggest James Bond fans on the planet. I get a sense that you're up there too. So I'm really excited to be talking to you about the series. So um, I I probably got into Bond when I was a teenager and I just became obsessed with him. And I probably have seen all of the pre-Craig movies at least 20 or 30 times. So it's like, yeah. I, I'm pretty- Oh, that's a serious Bond fan. Serious, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so- I want to, there's a number of things we can discuss. First, I just got to get off my chest because I think that you've made your uh, public, let's say, disdain. Is that too strong of a word for the, for the Craig movies? Pretty no, it's out not. There. <laughs> <laughs> so what's up? Why do you, why do you hate the Daniel Craig Bond movies so much? Um, I don't know about hate. I just find them boring, okay. incredibly boring. Um, you were talking about, uh, people acting up a masculinity um, in, instead of actually being masculine. And I see that with the Craig Bond movies. Um, there's too much of an effort to try and make him look really tough and hard. And, you know, it's like I prefer the old Bonds where Bond was having a laugh. And um, I, I love the, uh, the Sean Connery, Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton era. Um, yeah, there, there's so much to go into about that. Yeah, but it's, I, I find the new ones are too fake. Uh, ironically, they, they try to be more realistic, but they're not more realistic. They're just as stupid as the old ones. Um, but they try to put this uh, veneer of realism on it um, that isn't there. The plots are just as stupid. The, the characters are just as stupid. The fights are just as unrealistic. But in the old movies, they embraced it and they 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 didn't lie about it. And they, they acknowledged to the audience and said, look, you know, we know this is absolute garbage. We know this is juvenile, teenage, um, masculine, sexual fantasy, and it's, it could never happen in the real world. But we are going to fulfill those deep fantasies that you've got on the most brilliant level. Um, you know, you know, you, we're, we're going to take the fantasy beyond what even you would would do with it. You know, um, and I love how they did that because to, for me that felt very honest. They made the movies unrealistic. But I think that was honest because the fantasies that we men have that were being fulfilled by the movies, those fantasies are unrealistic to begin with. So I think the more mature approach is to present it unrealistically on the screen. Hmm. Um, and the new movies try to uh, pretend that it's not pretend. <laughs> yeah. They do have this like grittiness and this uh, realism we don't have exploding pens and uh you know helicopters and suitcases and women with ridiculous names and and things yeah. like that but um there, but I, I don't think they are more realistic by the way i don't i, I think I, they're I, just I, as stupid <laughs> yeah i think you can definitely make that case that they're not more realistic i i do think that for most of the series 
they are catering to the male fantasy. It's like, who would want to be this dashing secret agent who lives a life of adventure and beds all these beautiful women and saves the world? I mean, it's like, hard. sign me up for that. That sounds fantastic. Mm-hmm. And there seemed to be some sort of like crisis of conscience about this that happened in my, I think the first signs we see of it are in Goldeneye, which yeah. I watched yeah. a couple of years ago. A lot of people that are my age have this romanticized view of Goldeneye, I think because of the video game that came up uh, at that time, around the time when we were kids. Yeah. And so we love Goldeneye. But when you go back and watch it, it's actually kind of depressing. And a lot of that movie, they spend just like flagellating Bond for his misogynism, for his, you know, being out of date. You know, you know the money penny, the new young money penny isn't going to flirt with them. So she's she's too good for his advances. And it's like, we can't have fun anymore in, in Goldeneye. And it was like, we have to start uh, we have to stop the the superficial male fantasy that we've been indulging in for too long. And not only that, we have to enact some sort of penance on mm. men. And I actually think that that's where we're getting with in the Craigs. Because I do, I do think that, um, you know, every actor who played Bond certainly brought something unique to the role. And I think that's also not just a, a representation of who he was as a person or an actor, but also of the times. And um, I think what Craig brought to Bond was that we hadn't really seen in Bond before is that I can take it. I can take whatever you throw at me and still stand up. Like I'm tougher than anything else. It's like, you couldn't think Roger Moore, I don't think could really get the crap beaten out of him. Maybe, you know, he'd probably keep a stiff British upper lip, but like (laughs) Craig is just... No matter what you throw at me, no matter if, if you... Well, can... it's the same with Connery, by the way. I mean, like, a lot of people think of Connery as being a tough bond, but actually when you see him with his shirt off in the movies, he was just as skinny as Roger Moore. He just had a hairy chest. But hairy chest doesn't stop bullets or punches, does it? You know, so... <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had Bond, like, running through drywalls in Casino Royale and just, like, being this, this almost this unhinged weapon of, like, pure id and destruction that needs to kind of be reined in in Casino Royale to become a more targeted, effective assassin, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that the the Craigs are kind of a, um, I mean, we're, we're talking about how to be a man in a modern society that kind of doesn't believe in men, that thinks that men have done all kinds of bad things in the past and not only maybe shouldn't be in power anymore, but maybe need to be brought to bear for those transgressions those historical transgressions and um that bond as the man who's like who gets things done and it's tough is becoming increasingly irrelevant like you see that in the exchange with q in casino royale and they made q into this um this young nerdy character we also find out in no time to die that he's gay and he basically says that you know, you're t- I can do more damage on my laptop than you could in your entire life. You're you're just someone needs to pull the trigger every once in a while. And so we're using you. You're just like this brute animal. You don't really have a place. Yeah. And you also see that in the storyline in like um uh, what is it, Spectre, where uh who is it? C is trying to take over MI6. It's like the the whole MI6 empire is we don't need this anymore. We're globalists. Uh, we need to move beyond this parochial view of nationality. It's just like the whole thing about that Bond is coming up against in the Craig films is you are irrelevant. Like that just gets told to him over and over and over again. And over and over and over again, he shows that he's not. Like, I think that's the the male fantasy today, which is <laughs> men live in this society where they're kind of being told in so many ways that they are increasingly irrelevant yeah you know we're not that's a good take on it i like that yeah and and craig's and he kind of takes it on the chin every time it's like the exchange with vesper on the train when he just like smiles as she skewers him and no one really fucking believes in him but he is he gets the job done and Mm. almost everybody comes around and respects him in the end and i think that's the new male fantasy not that i'm gonna go and bed you know 30 different women and have a bunch of cool cars it's that like I can still be a man and be respected and celebrated for doing so. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I can I can see that reading of it. Um, I don't. For me, it doesn't make the movies work for me um, because 
what in order to be respected as a man, you have to save the world and fucking go through all kinds of pain and beating people up and fighting and stuff. But that's so, the male fantasy so version. What, of it. Does that mean a woman doesn't have to go through that? Does that mean some other person from some other group doesn't have to do that? Why is it only a uh, a male has to do that? You know, it's a good point. Um, so yeah, it's not a message that I agree with. Yeah. Um, but I also never got the the feeling in. I didn't see Spectre, but I saw the other ones. I never got the feeling in any of those movies that he ended up respected at the end at all. For me, the endings were always just flat and dull. Um, well, he died in the last one, didn't he? <laughs> well, he does, and then they toast him, and you know everybody's very sad. Uh, Vesper comes around after he's... Everybody scoops. acts very sad. Uh, maybe you're right. It's a difference, isn't it? <laughs> I saw some interesting takes. Uh, one thing that I do think was great about the Craig series is that really for the first time you see continuity between the films which i think was something that the series as a whole really uh missed out on like i think you see sylvia trench for two seconds in from russia with love and she's the girl uh, that you meet at the baccarat table in dr no but other than that other than like q and money penny and uh, there's like no every every movie is it takes place in like this almost in its own time capsule. Well, Hermetically I mean, sealed yeah. universe, exactly. Yeah. And I think that... Was... I, I do kind of like that, though, because oh, yeah? I love the fact that with all the old movies, you can just say, which Bond movie do I feel like watching today? And you can dive into any one of them, and it's a complete whole experience on its own. Um, whereas the new ones, it's, yeah, it's more like a series. I, I, I prefer the old style, but I can understand that there, there are appeals to having a continuous story between them all but there's some interesting things that come out of the uh the disconnected nature between the old um bond films it's almost like they're all remakes of the same story <laughs> you know um, the formula for sure yeah definitely the same formula they're all remade lots and lots of different ways um and you kind of always knew what the outcome was was going to be but there's, there's things about that that i found really fascinating and one of them is uh, if you looked at them as being continuous, a continuous Bond story, what happens to each um, woman he gets with at the end of each movie before the next movie? Is the I was actually thinking I might do a video on this at some point. I think you talked you know, about this in one of your episodes. You have a little pet. Probably theory about dead. That. Yeah, I mean, does he does he do, does he kill them off? Does he uh, you know is he a serial killer? Uh, does he just go and sneakily dump them as just some woman broken hearted crying her eyes out somewhere while he's he's off adventure in, in the world meeting the next girl. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you don't often see that. You see that I think in uh Tomorrow Never Dies, where he goes up to uh Terry Hatcher's character and she just slaps him. And I think this is the first time in a film where Bond gets reintroduced to a woman that he has seduced in the past. You don't usually <laughs> see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then he succeeds in seducing her again. So I guess also, yeah, yeah, of course he does. Yeah, yeah. There's always an excuse to let Bond off with um with being a naughty boy, isn't there? You know, so it, it was usually like he, he sleeps with one girl or two girls early in the movie, and they get killed by the bad guys. But sometimes Bond even slip slips up and accidentally puts them in danger, and they get killed anyway. But then he gets to be with the, the woman he really wants in the movie at the end, and he doesn't have to have the guilt of dumping the other ones because they got killed. <laughs> I think um, I, that's certainly the formula. I, I don't know the numbers, but I get the sense that in recent movies, he seduces fewer women per movie. Like yeah, the I last so, two, yeah. I think, were all about Madeline Swan. And there are there's some there's some other eye candy in that movie, but I don't think he actually seduces them. My favorite girl in No Time to Die was Paloma, the girl that did you see that one, Rob? I've seen it. Yeah, I can't remember much of it. <laughs> really, I've only seen it once. <laughs> that one really uh, kicked me in the teeth. Um, Paloma is the girl that she he meets up with, I think, in Cuba with Felix, and they have like a, a big gunfight. She's super competent. She's on the floor shooting the people and, and drinking yeah. with her. And at the end, he like shakes her hand, says, good job. And it's uh, like, it's almost, that one felt a little heavy handed. It's like, man, this is how you're supposed to treat female colleagues. And, you know, even if they're beautiful and, um, you know, this is a male fantasy. So, uh, but I do think that, you know, he didn't sleep with her. And in fact, 
um, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding in a scene where she brings him into a closet to get him into to change into like an outfit and um, he thinks that they're going to have sex and she's just like no 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 um, that actually happens in a different point in the movie with the woman who becomes the new 007 uh, she kind of picks him up at the club and they go back to his house and he just is she's like is the bedroom over here and he's like okay i guess we're doing this and it turns out that she's the new 007 and they're not going to have sex so it almost feels like the i think the number of seductions has decreased significantly in recent years mm -hmm. and i think that is um maybe that just has to do with the political climate or uh how some of the seductions in the bond series have really kind of toyed with the line of consent let's put it that way i'm thinking well, of there's, there's a, a funny thing with the from what i recall with the the craig bond films where if he does sleep with a woman it has to it has to be because there's been some sort of a trauma he's been through a horrible time or she's been through a horrible time and it's kind of like um blocking out the raw sexual attraction and making out that it's like, oh, this is an emotional connection based upon shared trauma. Sure. Uh, which again, I find, I find it dishonest because people do have raw sex desires in real life. Mm -hmm. People do go around, you know, guys and, and women that go around and see people and um, just, uh, you know, decide I'm going to, I, I would like to just fuck this person. That's what people do. Sorry, can yeah. you hear my phone going off in the other room there? you're good okay my phone's going off if you can't hear it that's fine um so yeah people do have this raw pornographic desire for people who they just spot in the street or people they know that is what people are really like you know it's it's there um so i think to try and take the bond thing and hide that and say we're got we're only going to have bond have um sex with women when there's some emotional trauma that's gone on between them and they need to support each other. It's not always like that, you know. Um, I guess I, I don't see the point of making, trying to make Bond more realistic um, or to try and make Bond into a socially responsible uh, movie series. It was never intended to be anything like that. Um, if you're gonna make, if you're gonna do a spy series that is socially responsible, then you should have a spy who questions uh, the orders that he receives from. You should have a spy who looks into his own government um, and finds out who he's really working for, what they're really about, what their agendas are, not just the agendas of the enemy. Um, if you're gonna do a socially responsible spy film, you go down that route, and that would involve. James Bond going off in a, a direction that would be unrecognizable from anything we've seen before. There's like an underpinning. Of, there's an underpinning of the Bond movies where his own government is always in the right. It's always trustworthy. It might make some mistakes, but it's got the right ideas. It's you know uh, at heart, and therefore he is justified in killing people, blowing things up, whatever, attacking enemies in order to defend what his government uh, has ordered him to do. You know, that was always a, a, a naive aspect of Bond. Um, and it's almost like, it's like Bond is a, um, it's, it's like he's a mind slave, you know. Um, he's brainwashed into thinking that he should spend his life putting himself in danger in order to protect who? Who are these people who are giving him the orders, you know? I think so they play with that. If you're going to go realistic on Bond, I would say drop that stuff. Sure. Yeah. they. I think they play with that a little bit in Goldeneye, in the antagonism between... 007 and 006, who betrays mm -hmm. England, and you know Sean Bean is questioning for England. You know he's, and, he's only he's only a colleague, isn't he? The Sean Bean character. I'm talking about the people who are high up above Bond. Uh, absolutely, yeah. but I think that's in in the second definition of the shadow that I was mentioning. That's interesting in Goldeneye because 006 is like a double O who begins presumably to question the the righteousness of the British government and the orders and like goes rogue and betrays the government. And so mm -hmm. he's like the shadow side of 007 who just is blindly obeying orders and doing everything for queen and country. That's actually an interesting antagonism. So which, which film was that in? That's Goldeneye. Yeah. That's one of the best parts of, of that film is- I quite uh, like Goldeneye because it was a, a decent yeah. Bond film. Yeah. Sean Bean as, as Alec Trevelyan was, was fantastic. There is a, there is a spy movie that kind of 
off the top of my head that does do that. It's not an action-packed spy movie, but it's called The Lives of Others. Have you seen that one, Rob? Very, very good. Yeah. 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 And I think yeah, that I like touches it. on a lot of the themes that, that you discussed. That movie didn't get talked about very much. <laughs> no, I think it did win. You're one, of the, you're one of the very, very few people I've ever met who's uh, mentioned that movie. It's a great yeah. film. I think I saw that one in the theaters a long time ago. Did it win Best Foreign Picture? I'm not I'm not sure. I, I think, think it, it did win some awards. It won some awards somewhere. I can't remember why. It, it, it got some good recognition when it came out, and then it just seems to have been largely forgotten about in film discussion since then. Mm -hmm. I'd even forgotten about it myself for years. <laughs> Yeah, that was a pretty good one. Uh, I have to know, um, do you have a favorite Bond? Roger Moore. <laughs> oh, Roger, Roger, I have a soft spot for Moore too because the very first Bond movie I saw was um, The Man with the Golden Gun. Yeah. And uh, which I think is actually an underrated Bond, but it's certainly it not is, one yeah. of the best. Uh, and so I grew up kind of with Roger Moore. Hey, yeah. one, uh, well, I mean, what I, what I love about um, Roger Moore is that he's the happiest Bond. If you were going to pick any of the Bonds and live their life, I'd pick the Roger Moore one because he just seems to be really cheerful and happy everywhere he goes. And none of the bad things that happen seem to make a dent in him emotionally. You know, mm. um, He lives a great life and he's a real charmer and he's hilarious. He has a laugh. I wouldn't want to live the Daniel Craig Bond life because he's too miserable and angry and depressing I find them boring. I don't like people like that. I like people who've got a bit of life to them. Um, people who, they don't just take all the punches that life has got to give and get back up and fight back. They actually come back fighting and they're happy as well. They stay happy despite the traumas. I think um, for me, the new, the new bond is kind of like a symptom of something that's been going on for a long time where um, people value anger and uh, self pity far too much. You never got Roger Moore pitying himself in the in the, the Bond role. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, even the actor Roger Moore didn't take the role seriously. Um, but yeah, it's like this, like the Bond who has to be pitied because this happened to him when he was a child, or he got his heart broken and blah 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 blah. For me, Bond isn't a character you're supposed to pity. He's supposed to be someone who bounces back strong and positive every time. You know, so I love that. It's not realistic, but for me, that's a much better fantasy uh, as a Bond thing. I can respect that. I mean, I, I understand that if you can get through something, but you're so traumatized by having passed through it that you're devoid of any joy or meaning, then that's certainly a pyrrhic victory, isn't it? It's not a, it's not a victory. It's all really, is it? And you might physically survive, but you, your emotions haven't survived if you, if you stay in trauma zone. Do you have a favorite film? Favorite movie? Out of the, uh, the, the Bond series. Out of the Bond series? Yeah. Uh, mine, again, this is an unpopular choice, but I fucking love Moonraker. I love Moonraker too. And I, I did, when, the, when the pandemic just started, uh, I did a, a Bond-a-thon. I did a tournament of all the movies. I'm a huge Bond nerd. And Moonraker got really, really far. It's like the apotheosis of just the the the... Bond fantasy. It's like the formula is cubed. It, it's mm -hmm. just Bond to the moon. It's so over the top and it's so like self-aware of being over the top. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a joy to watch. It's so much fun. And it's it's there's so much good stuff to say about. It. I mean, it's gorgeously shot. Cinematography in Moonraker is fantastic. You know, not just the special effects, but just beautifully shot throughout. Um I mean, I mean, the themes of it are fantastic as well. You know, it's uh, particularly with the pandemic. You got this guy in the space station in the movie who's trying to use like uh, genetically engineered whatever the hell he's to, to, to kill people. Not that I'm saying that the the pandemic was that, but it's crossed all of our minds at some point. Anyone who says it hasn't crossed the mind is a liar. <laughs> it could well have been. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, there's also a massive uh, overlap between Moonraker and uh, Doctor Strangelove and 2001 A Space Odyssey. And this is true. I've documented this in some videos before. Um, there's sp very specific ref references to uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey in the novelization of Moonraker, which was written alongside with the movie. Um, yeah, there's loads and loads of great stuff. It's even got the thing, which uh, I, I don't... The only other movie I can think of that does this is Starship Troopers, where um, Moonraker shows a 
a future Hitler type character. And he was supposed to be a Hitler type character, like a Doctor Strange love German character. But they made it, they used a French actor because they needed to film in France when they were making Moonraker. Mm. Um, and he did a great job. I can't remember the actor's name who played the villain, but you know, French actor, he was, he was superb. But that character was scripted to be very specifically um so so he he had a german history um that he was an ex-nazi you know and so in moonraker that character shows up and he's creating this new master race and um bond sort of points this out later um when, when they're, they're arguing on the space station about his vision of the future but his totalitarian master race is a multicultural one he hasn't gone the hitler route He's gone down the path of I'm going to take these couples of all the different races and I'm going to bring them along and I'm going to create um, a, a version of Hitler's um, ideas about how the world was going to be, but I'm going to make it a multicultural version of it. And so Moonraker did that back in 1979. And for me, that 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 was a crystal ball ahead towards we got now because a lot of the people who are pushing um the multiculturalism and di diversity stuff don't give a, a damn about that stuff that's a tool that they are using to divide people that's the way i view it mm. um it, it's a lot of rich white people who are pushing that stuff to get other people attacking each other on the basis of race gender stuff like that and and that prevents people from actually looking at the very super rich at the top and saying hang on what are they doing to us you have to divide and conquer so I think that's been happening in a while, but I think Moonraker predicted that. And the other movie that predicted that was Starship Troopers because it showed um, a future society where um, you have uh, men and women as equally equally as soldiers um, fighting in the battlefield and stuff. And, um, and you have all the different races together. And it's like we've got this big, diverse future society, but it's a totalitarian one anyway, you know? So uh, those are the only two movies I can think of that tapped into that. So that was one good aspect of Moonraker. That's fascinating. Yeah, uh, I did notice that in the film when I rewatched it, that it was uh, not going the pure Aryan bloodline route when they did show the um, the couples that were selected to repopulate Earth, but they were all like beautiful and I presumably, you know, very gen genetically healthy. Like they were they were tested and uh, yeah. you know for their which de defeats the point of diversity. They're not diverse in terms of their level of health. <laughs> well, that's certainly true. So it's just taking Hitler's doctrine and instead of basing it on one single race, we're going to base it on the most healthy, beautiful specimens. You know, which, how is that any better? You know? Yeah, there is a, uh, there's a lot of uh, history that people don't understand about the like eugenics movement. There was a eugenics movement in the United States that yeah. predated the uh, eugenics movement in Europe. Uh, there were on, laws on the books in several U.S. states until I think maybe the 60s or 70s with mandatory sterilization of uh, certain individuals that were, um, yeah. say, cognitively impaired, for instance. Um, you know, pretty, pretty nasty laws. Um, but the the idea that we can um, we can move in the direction of that certain certain parts, certain types of individuals are really corrupting the nature of society. And it's it's our responsibility to cleanse society of these folks. I mean, that's a very old idea. And I don't know if it's ever going away. It sounds like what you're arguing is that it's it's just been transmuted into something that is absolutely more yeah. socially acceptable. And because of that, it's harder to see. Um, people don't see I, I don't, I don't f personally find it harder to see, uh, see. but maybe a lot of people do. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I made a video about the Dubai we're getting into the, Jung, the the Jungian shadow thing there. Well, you know, which is you know, like like I said, Carl Jung said this goes on with all wars, uh, with the Nazis. Uh, we fought the Nazis, and they are the evil ones, completely, utterly evil, and we are absolutely right to fight and defeat them and do whatever is necessary to defeat them, but we're not recognizing that what is there in the Nazis is there in us as well, yeah. in Britain and America and everywhere else. It was true back then, it's still true now. I, I mean, if I remember rightly, the Nazis, some of their propaganda stuff they used to put out, 
um, they would actually point out how um, um, the US treats uh, blacks, you know, and um, that was, well, they put that out as part of their propaganda, but there was some truth to it, you know. <laughs> So you got two sides who are who've got racism going on towards different groups, each criticizing each other's racism. It's just shadow stuff, projection, mm -hmm. you know, from both sides. I see that. Yeah. And I, I do. I, I'm conscious of the time, and I've really enjoyed the conversation so far, Rob. I, I will um, also mention, since we're talking about Moonraker, the you you called my attention this perceptual illusion about Dolly's braces. <laughs> I I had to go back and watch that movie as soon as I saw that video because I could not believe you. I had this incredibly strong memory of seeing Dolly's mouth break into a racist filled smile when she I know it's weird, isn't it? Jaws. I did as well. <laughs> and I was like, there's no way. I've seen that movie 40 times. I know that by heart. And she doesn't have braces. It was so it was so incredible that it I It is bizarre, that. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think your explanation for why that perceptual illusion existed in the minds of so many people, uh, I think it was, um, you know, persuasive. So thanks for bringing that to my attention. Well, I hope it was because I can't find that footage, the original footage, and uh, you Man, know. I sure thought she did, but I went at least on the DVD versions. I had the VHS versions back when I was a kid. I don't think I have them anymore. Um, I did notice uh, you've only saw. No Time to Die once, so you mm. probably wouldn't catch this. But there was changes in the movie from the theatrical release to the DVD release. They're not the same film. I don't know why they did this, but there were they changed the scene between Bond and uh, the villain. Who who is what's his name? Uh, Lucifer. Lucif it's like Lucifer, Luciferin, or something like that. I can't remember. I can't even remember what he Rami looks Malik, like. Rami the, Malek, the, the, the character that Rami Malek plays. When Bond confronts him in his fortress and they have that back and forth about like some men, I remember very explicitly in the theater because it was a very weird shot where usually they do this, um, you, you know, the kind of perspective taking back and forth within the conversation. And then there was this shot where the camera looks right at Bond and Bond looks right into the camera, which never happens and he basically says some people don't, you know, want to play God. And it was mm. just this really jarring shot that doesn't exist in the DVD release. And there's a few other mm. lines that have been changed and the shots have been changed. I think as far as I can tell, only in that conversation. And I have not been able to find any information about this on the internet. I don't know if anybody else has even noticed this, but mm. I guarantee I'm remembering this correctly because it was such a jarring change and that kind of, you know, close up yeah, right yeah. to the camera I mean, look. They, they, these things do happen, don't they? Uh, do you think that happened with Dolly's braces? I'm thinking. I'm thinking it's possible because you think that you had this strong memory of the braces. I think I had the strong memory of the braces. But why would they? It doesn't make sense that they would like get rid of braces yeah. from the VHS. I mean, you did mention before that there was uh, the thing about when you were younger, you watched the movie on uh, VHS. Yeah. And I, th I think I put that in the video I did about it where. When you're watching the VHS, because it's a, a, a lower resolution image, mm. it, you're going to be more likely to perceive braces there. Um, you know, of, often watching a HD movie makes it look so much different visually. And there's been times when I've, I've done studies of movies, uh, years like some of my early film studies, I had to rely on uh, DVDs. I didn't have, uh, there wasn't really hardly any HD movies out back then when I first started doing film analysis. And there would be points where I would thought that I could see certain things in the sets and movies. And then when I get the HD version, suddenly it's more clear. And I say, okay, that's what it is. Okay. I would it never be. have been able to guess that. So it could be uh, something like that. I always thought, though, that it was such a clever little visual thing that the directors were doing because you have Jaws, who's this monstrous, yeah. not only is he tall, but he's monstrous because he has this like bunch of metal in his mouth. And you would think he'd be terrifying to this small yeah. little girl. And then when she smiles, she has metal in her mouth too. It, it, it makes like, absolute oh. sense. That, yeah, it makes total sense that the braces should be there. Yeah. Um, definitely. And the, the way she slowly uh, smiles, you, you you think, oh, there's going to be a slow revealing of the of the braces there. And yeah, it, it is. It's a it's a, an incredible illusion there, unless there really is some sort of 
uh, conspiracy where the footage got changed or something. I don't know. What's, uh, I, don't, yeah. I don't think so. I don't know why they would take the braces out, but I <laughs> want to know why they changed the dialogue in that scene in No Time to Die. So if anybody out there knows, please get in touch with me. <laughs> uh, Rob, I, I feel like I could talk to you all day, but I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, anything else you'd like to say? Uh, not that I can think of, no. I can't remember if there was any other subjects we wanted to discuss. Uh, I mean, whatever, is, if there's is any last topic you'd like to quickly cover or, you know, whatever. Mm, well, we can leave Bond. Um, I, I'd i like to know maybe if you have any film recommendations for folks out there. I, I have the uh, Criterion channel. Do you have that, Rob? Uh, I haven't got the channel, no, but I've got lots of movies that are from the Criterion Collection. Yeah. I don't get any kind of kickback from saying this, but I highly recommend that people look into the possibility of getting a Criterion Channel subscription. It mm. is fantastic. It's 100 bucks a year, and you get access to thousands and thousands of like the highest grade world cinema classics, um, movies that are very hard to find anywhere. Yeah. Certainly, you're not going to find them on Netflix. Um, and so that's really helped me to broaden my uh, cinematic horizons. But um, always looking to know where I'm, what I'm missing. So do you have any uh, recommendations for folks? Okay. So I was trying to think of some amazing movies, which hardly anybody knows about or talks about. And one spring, springs to mind, came out the same year as 2001, A Space Odyssey. <clears throat> but it cleared up at the Oscars was the musical version of Oliver. You know, Oliver Twist? Sure, I saw that a long time ago. Yeah, that is an amazing movie on all kinds of levels. Wow, I haven't seen it in a, while, in a long time. Why, oh. why do you think that's that movie's so great? Uh, the size of the production is just incredible. Just on the pure technicality of the, the scale of the production, the songwriting and musical score is incredible. I don't even like musicals generally. It's usually my least favorite genre. And for me, that's the best musical ever made. I like pretty much all the songs in it. Um, the, the the actors, the, the set designs, you know, the many um, classic performances in it. Um, Oliver Reed was amazing as Bill Sykes, and you, you got uh, is it Tom Moody as plays Fagan. Um, there's just so much good stuff in that movie. I've been wanting to make a video about it for years, but not really got. I, I did make a, a short video on the Bill Sykes character, but yeah, that's a movie that. Uh, still massively impresses me, uh, me today. Um, I think partially I like it because <clears throat> it gets into this really dark aspect of uh, history, uh, how people lived and suffered and died in, in, in parts of Britain back then. And, and um, But the subject matter is so grim that the movie has to use um, a musical presentation in order to stopping the blow for the audience. Mm. If it was just done in the same with, with the, the same crew and director and everything, um, with no musical aspect to it, I think it would have been too grim for people. Um so yeah, I think the 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 musical framing of it makes it very palatable. Yeah, it's fantastic. One of my one of my top 20 favorite movies ever. Oh, that's a pretty um, strong um, recommendation. I watched a long time ago when I went through all of the best picture um films. I haven't seen it in years, but on that recommendation, I will check it out again. Mm, yeah. Okay. Call Rob, if people want to know more about your stuff, where can they find you? Uh, on the YouTube channel, collativelearning.com, uh, C-O-L-L-A-T-I-V-E, Collative Learning, or on the website of the same name. And um, yeah, yeah, there's, there's a couple hundred videos there on the YouTube channel. Some of them are really long, like two hours long. Some of them are just short ones. And then on the website, there's uh, articles and stuff available there as well. Yeah. I'll put uh, mostly links... on film analysis, but sometimes on psychology stuff as well. I'll put links in the descriptions for folks. And uh, some of those videos are definitely worth watching, even the longer ones, um, especially the ones on The Shining. Uh, blew my mind, man. So really great work. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Thanks for having me on. It was a, it was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. All right. All right. We'll touch. All right. Bye. Bye.